uh, a, an Italian film producer uh, bought the rights to a Stephen King book uh, called Firestarter in 1984. And he brought that movie. It starred Drew Barrymore when she was seven years old. And we had Art Carney and, and George C. Scott and Martin Sheen and quite a cast on that film. And uh, my brother and I had worked as extras on a couple of movies in Charlotte. So we drove down and convinced the producer to hire us to pull together his extras for Firestarter. Well, you know, as soon as you're in the casting department, all of a sudden they're saying, we can't afford to bring all these actors from LA and New York. Do you know any actors? And we're like, well, yeah, we all studied, you know, theater and we, you know, we know a lot of actors. So they said, well, the next movie we do, we want you to go find as many of these actors as you can here so we don't have to fly them in. So uh, that's kind of what kicked it off. Dino De Laurentiis made, uh, filmed the movie Firestarter and then he actually fell in love for the second time in his life and his wife, uh, who he, he, this love interest, he, he ended up marrying and having two children with and she was with him till he died at 93 years old, about seven years ago. But uh, she said, Dino, it's not time for you to retire. It's time for you to take your resume to the market and let other people pay for your movies. So Dino did just that. He created De Laurentiis Entertainment Group. It was called DEG. And they raised $270 million in 1985. And over the next three and a half years in Wilmington, we did 23 feature films. Dino brought the best directors, the best costume designers, the best production managers producers in the world he brought to this little town along the coast of North Carolina called Wilmington. And we just happened to be there. And so we found ourselves three and a half years later with a resume with 23 feature films on it. I wouldn't have probably had that if I had moved to California right out of college and worked a lifetime, I probably wouldn't have done 23 films. So it, it's crazy how it happened. Um, but ultimately, uh, that's kind of, you know, and with each one of those movies, we needed more actors. So I was, we were constantly doing open calls. Dolphin Girl Dove. Yeah, hey there, can you mute, can you mute your, um, great, thank you so much. Um, so uh, anyway, then, uh, you know, uh, uh, Andy Griffith was ready to retire. He was living in Los Angeles doing a television series called Matlock. And uh, they said, well, we're making a million dollars an episode. You don't want to retire right now, do you? And he said, all right, move the show to North Carolina. I can move home. And then on the weekends, I can get home pretty easily. So season seven, eight, and nine of the show Matlock was filmed in Wilmington. And then uh, an, another North Carolina writer wrote a little show called Dawson's Creek that ended up being pretty successful. It ran for six years. So we had six years of Dawson's Creek in Wilmington. And then they had a spinoff show called One Tree Hill, which ran for nine years. So the craziest thing, we had 15 years in a row of television series work going on in Wilmington. And you can imagine as all these years went by, we needed more and more actors, more and more actors. So more agents would open their businesses and bring in 20 actors, 30 actors, 40 actors, 50 actors. And in those days, um, actors would drive to our offices and audition for the directors live and in person. So I did that for years and years and years. And then in 2008, uh, yeah, I was doing One Tree Hill. I think we were in season six or seven. And uh, actors used to drive from Atlanta and sometimes Nashville, but they would drive from Atlanta to Wilmington. It was a six hour drive. They'd get up at seven in the morning, come to Wilmington, do a four minute audition, and then get back in their car and drive back to Atlanta. And this went on every seven days for every episode of every show we did. Well, in 2008, for those of us who can remember, gas cost was $4 and 50 cents a gallon and the stock market kind of crashed. We had a reset in the uh, economics of America. And so basically the actors said, we can't afford to come audition. So I thought, oh boy, I still got to cast a show. What are we going to do? So I said, well, why don't you go to your agent's office? I'll fax the sides, the scenes from the film and I'll fax them over there and your actors can come to your office and you can just audition them in front of the camera in your office. 
-hmm. and then you can FedEx that VHS tape overnight to our office and I'll show it to the director. And that's basically what started self-taping. We didn't do it because we wanted to not be with the actors. We just did it because of pure economics. And then we went from VHS tapes to DVDs to mini DVDs. And then ultimately we learned how to stream. So I can send out a request to actors now. Uh, Tania? Oh, no, I don't guess it's Tania. Maybe it is. No, it's not Tania. Somebody else uh, is not muted. I'm not sure who that is. Anyway, I think they caught it. Anyway, um, so, um, you know, now pretty much everything, and, that, and, and the, actually the fortunate thing for actors in the Southeast is that because we've been doing this now for three or four years, when COVID came along, we didn't get thrown. But the actors in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, places like that, when they, where they could not invite the actors to their offices to audition in live because of COVID, they were starting to ask their actors to take their auditions and their actors didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what kind of camera, what kind of lighting, where do I do that? Where do I find an actor that's gonna play the scene with me? And um, so we've had a pretty distinct advantage here in the Southeast. Um, uh, you know, I've worked a lot as I began this conversation in Nashville, so I know the agents very, very well. We've all worked together for many, many years, and they are incredible. They're hardworking. And, um, you know, I just, when I think of Nashville, I think very fondly of the talent pool there and the market itself. I, what I want to do is make sure that I get to your questions. So what I think we should do is you should just start typing in your questions and then Linda, why don't you or, or someone else that's working with you start to read those chats. And if you see one that really is, you know, is an interesting question, then why don't you just cut in and say, Hey, uh, so-and-so has a question and then I'll click on them and we'll have a conversation. Um, okay, I'll be glad to do that. And would you kind of, while we're waiting for these questions, would you yeah. kind of touch yeah. on what what you think, um, how we should be doing our taped auditions and what, what do you think is important for us to all remember in doing taped auditions? Yeah, well, they should be, um, let me pull back here right quick. Uh, I'm an advocate of very close auditions. So I really want auditions kind of right in here, the way I am on the screen. Uh, Spielberg sent us a, uh, an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, probably 15 years ago. And this is what was on the paper. He said, that's the framing I want. <laughs> And the reason he did that is because he really likes to see in the soul of an actor. He doesn't want to get taken out by the scene because you're way back here and you're trying to play the scene and you can't, it's really just not as effective. It's like the old days when people would do a headshot like this. Well, if 10 people did a headshot like this and one actor did a headshot like this, who has the advantage? You know, at the end of the day, when we put all the headshots up on the wall, is it this shot or is it this shot? You know, so I'm a big advocate of that. Um, I think um, if you have a, everybody should have a professional reader to play, or not really a reader, another actor to play the scene with them. Um, and if that actor is standing beside the camera, if it's just a typical VHS camera with a mic on it, then sometimes that actor's voice is louder than the, actor that's auditioning. So you need to get a lavalier mic, a clip-on mic, or a shotgun mic so that the sound is more on the actor's performance and that actor's sound than it is the actor who's standing beside the camera. So you need to work on that. You also should not have a busy background. I mean, my office here is really, really busy. You should just be standing in front of a 
a, a plain gray or light blue or you know some kind of a background that does not distract from you at all you also should have a little kind of rear lighting i don't know if i can do that here but see my effect changes a little bit when you have light here that's a little severe but lighting is better it's nice to have because it gives you a bit of a three-dimensional you know quality when you have a bit of highlight so you can just play around with lighting um but at the end of the day one of the questions one of the yeah. questions said how can i build a relationship with casting directors when i'm new to the market that's francesca rose asked that question that is a great question you know ultimately our system is run by casting directors working with agents so your number one thing that you need to really try and achieve is to get representation from one of the agents in the in the nashville market or in the knoxville market or in memphis there's two or three agents in each one of those cities and they represent actors that come to atlanta all the time sometimes go over to north carolina sometimes go down to new orleans i've been act uh, casting actors out of tennessee for years and years and years who you know do their jobs in atlanta or north carolina or um you know just all over the southeast not just jobs in nashville uh, but number one is to have an agent and um another I, yeah yeah another question was uh, do you prefer actors who make bold choices when submitting for an audition or those who take a uh, safer approach that's peter vance Peter, that's a fantastic question. I think you you can afford to do both. I think uh, you should make the performance your own. You shouldn't try and perform to what you think I'm looking for or what you think the director is looking for. You should make it as real every day. You know, a camera just happens to walk through a room that you're in. You know, it's not like you're playing to a camera. It's just picking up on a on a very real moment that you're having with someone. Uh, at the time. Uh, obviously, if I see 30 actors for every, you know, role that I'm trying to cast, after a while, if they all do what we think we're looking for, then they all seem the same. So anytime you can do something that's just really unique to your own personality, to what your own nuances are, then I think you should do that. And with the shorter scenes, you should always feel comfortable to do two takes. Just always clip them and and put them in the you know in the audition as two different takes then i can watch them both and based on what i know i can choose the best one to send on to the team thank you so much mark of course good to see you okay here's another one i'm a college student majoring in film at university in nashville i'm going into casting and would love to stay in the south do you recommend Wilmington, Atlanta, or Nashville? I would prefer to help with casting in film and television. What advice do you have about taking that path? Uh, such a good question, and congratulations for uh, being in college. Stay focused on college right now, but really Atlanta is the hottest city in the world, really in terms of pure on-set on, on production. Um, there's probably 10 to 12 casting directors that compete with me on every job that comes into the Atlanta market. So there's plenty of opportunities for you to get in one of those offices working as an assistant. And then you go from being an assistant to being an associate. And then you go from being an associate to being a casting director. We have three associates that work for us now. We have one in Wilmington, one in Atlanta, and one in Austin, Texas. Um, you know, you can almost live anywhere. My associates that help me on my shows in Atlanta, one of them is in Austin and one of them's in Wilmington. They're not even in Atlanta, but they handle all my paperwork. We do everything online. We do all our auditions online. We do all the deals through, you know, emails and everything else. So, uh, we're not doing even a lot of callback auditions right now just because, uh, because of COVID. And so we just get the very best auditions that we can possibly get. We do our vetting process of making sure that the actor didn't just happen to do a good take. And when they get to the set, they're going to freak out <laughs> because that happens. And that happens with immature casting directors that don't really know how to, uh, you know, 
uh, vet actors. But basically for you is really when you graduate is the, you know, start, you can write our office. We'll see if we, if we need any help at that time. And if not, I'll be happy to put you on to a couple of the other casting offices and you can check with them. It will be a little bit harder right now because basically you need to be, you need to have the experience now because you know, in the old days, we were in a casting office and we were all in the office together. We were bringing actors in all the time. Well, we don't do it that way anymore. Now everything's online. So I just, if I'm looking to hire somebody, I need somebody who already has a lot of experience, knows the Screen Actors Guild, all the union rules and regulations, and knows all the contract paperwork stipulations, and knows how to deal with talking to networks and studio executives on a daily basis. Um, but yeah. you can do it. Um, you absolutely can do it. All our associates started. Uh, they got internships out of college. Every single one of our associates got internships in their senior year working in a casting office. And because you were free labor <laughs> and you got credit at the same time, if you work hard and really learn during that internship program, many times they go right on into getting a job. Molly Breen asks, which film or series has been your favorite or most interesting casting experience? Well, for sure, uh, my feature film was called End of the Spear, and it was about five missionary couples in their 20s who went down into the jungles of Ecuador in 1956, and the five men reached out to an unreached tribe of naked savages basically and they had friendly contact with them one day and then three days later the tribe attacked these five men and spear killed them all only to have one of the wives and one of the sisters within nine months move into the tribe that killed their husband and brother and finish the work of telling them that god loves them and that they don't need to continue to kill but they need to lay down their spears they need to forgive and move on well, it's, it was an unbelievable story, true story. Um, but imagine the phone call the day I got it saying, hey, we, we wrote a script, but we wrote it from the point of view of naked savages, not the point of view of the missionaries. So we have 27 roles that are natives who run through the jungles with spears. We need you to cast that. How do you do that? Well, I'm a praying guy and I found myself in Panama and I literally got in a canoe, went up into the rainforest of Panama and I found indigenous tribal people living in villages and uh, went to three different villages and convinced their chiefs that, about this movie. They were all moved by the telling of the story and said, we'll help you any way we can. So we did a school and trained them all and we actually recreated uh, the story of uh, Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and the five uh, men who basically went and changed an entire culture by bringing them um, bringing them the scriptures. And uh, so that was, uh, uh, I actually have a, uh, I think you can probably find it on YouTube. If you just type end of the spear casting, I had like a 16 minute making of the casting of that film. Uh, that I think is on YouTube somewhere. You might want to check that out. It, it was pretty amazing experience. Great question, though. Okay. We have another question. Let's see. Uh, hey, hi, Cookie. Uh huh. Cookie, says, keep going. To women of the movement, could you yeah. explain to act why following instructions, even though your office doesn't have one-page instructions, but your notes, etc., in a self-tape or retape? are so very important in the electronic world of casting. I've explained a lot, ha ha ha, but I'd yeah. love for them to hear it from you. Yes, yeah. I think I think the major question of all of us is um, number one, uh, do we do we just follow what the script is that we've been given and, and submit the tape that way? Or do we add more to it? Or do we, what do we do? Well, you know, the best way for me to explain it, I probably learned more being in the jungles of Ecuador doing that movie about acting uh, because I never understood a word those people ever said. 
during the entire time I lived there, I didn't understand what they said. And even their performances, I didn't understand what they said. So they had to move me by being so authentically in the moment that I couldn't take my eyes off of them. So I think when you see material, when you get your sides, yes, you should memorize the dialogue, but the dialogue is not the most important thing. The most important thing is what's happening in this moment and how, what's someone saying to me and how's it impacting me? And, and how do I think that would, you know, how would this character react based on what, is being said to me or what I may want to be trying to influence the other actor into, into saying, but to answer your question specifically, you should, you obviously you need to stick to the script. These writers spend hours and hours and hours to put these words together. So you need to be, you know, you need to be uh, authentic with the stuff, but you need to make it your own. Um, in terms of Kim's question, um, you know, I don't like to give a whole lot of notes. So if I give notes, it's a big deal. I expect that you read those notes and I expect that you attempt to do what I'm asking you to do in those notes. I think some casting directors have very specific details of how you do your slate, whether it's a wide shot, a long shot, a medium shot or whatever. So to serve every casting directors, please read every dot and tittle, as my dad used to say, of, of the notes and, and uh, respond to them uh, as specifically as you can. But in terms of performance, like I said, just get in there and get with a real good actor and play the scene and let us experience what's happening inside your soul as you're, as you're living this moment. The, one of the questions is from a filmmaker who says, uh, how do film producers best reach out to casting agencies to cast their films? And yeah, that's, well, uh, Vic Victor that's uh, right. Valerie that's Conley. Right. Okay, great. Valerie, um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think you can, guess I'm not even sure, the, the CSA, the Casting Society of America, you can easily find online. And basically, if you are, you know, a casting office that's been in the industry for quite some time and, and is, re is respected, kind of like the Screen Actors Guild Union for Actors, is the CSA organization for casting directors. And we've been members of CSA for probably 20 years or whatever. Uh, we have our own annual uh, award show and all that stuff. But on that site, you can find the names of the casting agencies in all the different parts of the country. And then you should just reach out to them by email, send them maybe the pitch package of the project that you're working on, uh, give them an idea of whether or not you have your funding. If you have your funding, that always makes it so much easier. A lot of casting directors, just like actors, don't really want to have that conversation with you unless until you're ready, until you have the money in the bank. What is so difficult about it anymore is, you know, most producers are like, well, I've got everything in order, but my funder won't give me the money unless I can say that I have a certain actor or I have a certain name or whatever. Well, the actors don't want to look at the material if they think that it might not happen because they hate, they hate to invest emotionally into a script that they might love. And then all of a sudden, if the money's not there, you know, they, they've spent a day, you know, kind of reading through a script and that, that, that might have actually moved them, but then they're disappointed because the money's not there. So you really just kind of have to get your money together. And uh, then basically you work out a, a financial arrangement with a casting uh, company, and then they go about trying to help you uh, put together, you know, uh, your cast all your supporting cast and, uh, and you know, the leading, the, the, the cast for your lead roles as well. Yeah. Cheryl Mann from VNC Talent asked, uh, what would you tell actors if there is language they are not comfortable with in sides? Well, you probably shouldn't audition for the role. And I don't mean, and, and I'm not trying to, uh, Here's the thing, if, if, if you really do have a struggle with that, then you're really not gonna be able to give the very best performance for that character the way the writer has written it. 
And I want to be clear here. Most actors feel pressured. Like I've got to take this. I've got to read this. I've got to audition this because they invited me. And if I don't audition it, they might not ever call me again. Well, that's simply not true. If you're a great actor six months from now or a year from now, and you're just the right actor for the role I need six months or for a year from now, I could care less whether you didn't read something last month. Um, if you end up trying to do something that you're uncomfortable with, first of all, you're being dishonest with yourself. Then you're being dishonest with the director. Then you're being with, uh, dishonest with the writer because there are other people that don't have the same convictions you have. And no one's judging you about that. You should never feel that way. You should just say, you know what, I'm just going to decline this particular project and I'm going to wait for something that I feel like I'm the right person to embody that character. I hope that helps. Another question is from um, uh, Gray Marino. He says, what is the industry like for local hires during this time? Oh man, they're getting to work more now than they ever have because we want actors that are local because we have to test them every three days. And uh, if we're having to bring an actor even from Nashville to Atlanta, they're discouraging me from doing that. They're saying, come on, you've got to be able to find these actors in Atlanta so that we can test them three days later, fit them three days later, test them again, and three days later, bring them to the set. But we don't need them coming back and forth from Nashville. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not still hiring actors out of Nashville, New Orleans, and other locations. But there is a lot of pressure. And it's not just day players anymore. Now they're saying, we don't even want to bring the guest stars from LA. We'd like for you to do everything you can to try and find the guest stars here in Atlanta. So I'm booking guest stars, I mean, every week on major network television shows now. More so now than ever, because they really want the actors to come from here. It's not, in the old days, it just used to be, oh, we got plenty of money, we'll bring them in. We got, you know, it's not an issue, but now it is an issue. Uh, because we have, you know, the challenges of the hour, so to speak. I think when when Riker, uh, good to see and hear yeah, from Wynn you. Yeah, had a question. Yeah. When I lost your question. Oh it, yeah, it slid down. He said, uh, "What do you prefer in a demo reel, compilation reel, or separate performance reels? And also, what length is best?" You know, I think um, when I think I'd like your complete demo reel, which are usually three to three and a half minutes long, that should be available to me because there are times I read a script and even in the middle of the night, and I may want to go, hey, I need to grab Wynn's demo, uh, uh, his reel, so that I can send it to the director in the morning and say, hey, I have this actor in mind. Would you take a look at this reel and tell me what you think? Uh, sometimes, though, I also like to have a comedy clip that's, 30 to 60 seconds, and then maybe a drama clip that's 30 to 60 seconds that's also available to me because sometimes if you've done an audition for me for say a drama, then I may attach that drama clip to your audition to give the producer and the director a little more idea of your, you know, how you come across uh, on film or, or that if you're playing a scene with, you know, Bobby De Niro or you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. or something like that, then it looks pretty impressive if I can put that clip with your audition to go uh, to the director. Oh, thanks, Mark. Yep. Um, somebody asked, what's your big, biggest pet peeve in a novel? Well, that's a good question. Um, in the old days, it was uh, people just aren't prepared. You know, they would drive from Atlanta six hours to Wilmington and walk in and go, you know, I'm sorry, just got the material. And I'm like, uh, yeah, what do you mean? Didn't you have a six hour drive on the way over here? You could have taped it and put it in your ear as a headset and you could have been talking the whole way because there's nobody else in the car with you. Uh, it's just really preparation because I'm telling you the competition you're going up against is is getting more and more challenging every single day. I mean, in the last month, I know of over 20 individual actors who have left Los Angeles and have moved to Atlanta. But they're coming here from New York, they're coming here from Chicago, they're coming here from, I mean, you know, they just wanna get the heck out of California. California has just become a 
very challenging place to live. And uh, they know that Atlanta is a pretty great place to live and there's a lot of work. So that's, you know, that's happening a lot. Um, what else Thank do we you. have here? Yes, you're welcome. Good to see you. Verona? Verona. Really close, it's Verona. Verona. Elia. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you. So are, all, are you in Nashville? Yeah, I am. Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine most people here are in Nashville. I did. See, I did see someone wrote a a text about being in Wilmington or something. Who was that? I live here, that Tracy. Me, Tracy. That's yeah, me. hey, Tr hey, Tracy. <laughs> so Hi. You, hey, so you asked the question, or Kestin Dirks will look for you to stick on into the script. Yeah, pretty much, because you know, particularly okay. in television. They're in writer's rooms and they grind these scripts and grind these scripts. And then if you're saying, well, you know what? I don't like what you read. I'm going to make it better. You know, it kind of, uh, it doesn't sit very well. And it, it doesn't mean you can't make it your own. And it doesn't mean you can't add a, oh, or wait or pause or whatever, you know, but, but, but words are, are, are like gold in television. Features are usually looser, but that happens on the set. You shouldn't do it in the audition. If that makes sense. Okay. Yes. Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Good to see you. Let's see. So when you cast TV shows in Atlanta, do you reach out to Nashville agents or just Atlanta agents? Uh, Ren, that's from Ren Vogel. Ren, we, uh, we reach out to everybody. I go out literally to 154 agents, I think every week on every episodic show that I do. Now I am being pressured to really look at all the Atlanta talent first. And then if I can't find it there, but you know, I've been doing this a long time. So I think of a certain actor in Nashville, or I think of a certain actor in New Orleans, or I think of a certain actor in Charlotte. And I say, there's nobody better for this role than that actor. I've got to see their work. And then when I get it, if it's as good as I expect, then I'm going to send it on to the producing team and say, you know, you should feel comfortable to bring this actor in and put them up and give them per diem and everything else because they're going to give you a performance like nobody else that I, you know, have available to us here. So we cast all over still. Um, you got any other questions that are standing out there, Jane or Linda? Let's see here. One individual asked if you would be accepting. Um tonight would you be accepting if they sent to you tonight to, or tomorrow i think that was dolphin girl dove right yeah who's that, that speak yes, up that take you? your mic off yes, yes who is that, that was me oh hey there so hi. do you hi do you have representation um not currently but i used to live in nashville but okay since the pandemic i've been living out in the islands so, okay. But I yeah. I send in a lot of tapes, so I'm I'm pretty familiar, you know, yeah. with doing self tapes. So right. I was just wondering if you would accept new, um, you know, clips. New yeah. Well, here's I think uh, I don't know if you were on from the very beginning, but we because we're dealing with COVID concerns and all that kind of yeah. stuff, it's going to be challenging for me to think about bringing you out of the islands, you know, back into Nashville or into Atlanta. You know, it, I think we just need to wait as long as we need to wait. And when you get back, I just highly encourage you pick up representation again if you don't, because they're the ones that I'm reaching out to every week. And it's not that I'm opposed to, you know, any actors who are not represented. But the fact is, I just can't keep up with everybody. I have a hard enough time keeping up with 154 agents, much less individual actors, their phone numbers, how to get in touch with them, where they're at. You know, so I leave that to the agents because I've got too many other things to do just to keep up, you know, with my show. But when you get back um, uh, into Nashville, you know, go see Talent Trek or go see Kim or go see, you know, uh, these other great agents there in, Nash in Nashville. Yeah, I was signed with Talent Trek. I mean, they're, right. they're lovely people. Yeah. Yeah, they are. Robin and everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Been, been around a long time. And yeah. uh, of course, someone there's asked, Avery sisters. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, oh, Mute somebody now, dolphin. Asked, dolphin girl. See, somebody asked about um, 
uh, how is it best to dress? Do we dress the part or do we just dress in black? Do we go, uh, do we, do we go so far out with the character when we're uh, self-taping? That's a great question. Uh, look, if it's blue collar, you should probably, you know, wear a blue collar type clothing. If it's white collar, then you should, you know, men should wear, a, 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 you know, a shirt and tie, maybe even a sports jacket. Uh, women should wear a professional executive clothing. Um, but all of it should be neutral. It should not draw away from your performance, just basically your character. Everything should be simple. But again, I do think it gives you a different, you carry yourself differently. If you're an executive with a tie and a sport coat, you wouldn't dress like that and play, you know, a, a good old boy on the farm, right? You, you know, or vice versa. So I think you would dress to the character to somewhat to help you internally kind of step into the shoes of that character. Uh, Mark, are you a proponent for um, uh, uh, an actor thinking outside the box? Like for instance, uh, maybe it's a, uh, a, uh, a uh, uh, desk clerk and, yeah. and the role yeah. calls for a man and uh -huh. maybe I think I could play it because yeah. it doesn't matter it is do you exactly. do you recommend an actor does that stretches themselves a little bit that way yeah well hopefully we as casting directors stretch ourselves that way and we bring in men and women and all races and genders and ages and you know we play around because we don't really know what those words uh, you know how, how they're best gonna kind of resonate with us as an audience until we actually see it so uh yeah we try and do that a lot i think uh I've had too many times though, early in my career, particularly when we were doing Dawson's Creek, when I would have actors drive six hours, walk into the room and the director would say, eh, I want to go female with that, or I want to go diverse with that or whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute, they just drove six hours. We should have had this conversation before they got in the car and drove six hours. So I started years ago, basically a casting concept meeting with my writing team, with the network, with the directors, with the producers, everybody on a phone call, and we would go through every single role, and we would, we would grind it out and say, "Do should this be male, female? What ages? Could it be anything? If it is, what is that? What is the age group and all that?" So that we all are on the same page before I go to do this hard work of seeing hundreds and hundreds of actors to find the best you know, person for the role. But that's a great question. And yeah, we try and stretch ourselves. And and because many times I, I get the opposite of that. I'll be asking someone to read a role. I'll ask a guy to read a role that's written as a female role. And they'll go, wait a minute, why'd you put me on this? You know, I we shouldn't be doing this. Well, you know, you just have to trust that if we've asked you to do it, you know, we're, we're experimenting. We're, you know, I always like to uh, kind of, uh, describe what I do is kind of like painting. You know, you start with a canvas, you know, a white canvas, and you try a little paint, you put it up there, you get a different color, and then you don't necessarily like that color, or you want to shade it a little bit or whatever. That's basically what I do all day, every day, and I just am using actors and all different types and shapes and sizes and ages to paint a picture that hopefully is a picture that people want to just sit and look at over and over.